<laughs> no worries at all. <laughs> I guess being on the student side, we just don't know all these controls. We are always on the phone. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So let's get started. Um, hello and welcome everyone to whosoever is listening to this podcast on uh, YouTube or uh, Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. Uh, I'm Jayesha. I'm a PhD student at Arizona State University working on interpretable AI models for uh, medical applications. And uh, welcome to this podcast channel. For this particular podcast, I have with us uh, Sharon Zhao, who is a PhD student at uh, Stanford University working with the very famous, uh, uh, I guess the only person most of the people know when they start the journey into machine learning, Andrew NG. So, um, and also most of the people who would be watching this video might know Sharon from her very popular course on GANs that is available on Coursera. Uh, and yeah, being a student, definitely I recommend everyone who is watching this video to um, take that course. It's a really nice course. So um, welcome Sharon. Uh, it's really nice to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jay. All, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. So a quick overview of before I start this podcast is I'll be talking to Sharon more about her journey into machine learning and how she really got started into the basics of um, starting from basics to now like the uh, being on the expert side of machine learning. So how she transitioned, what were her, what were the key things that she learned, and how did she do that? Uh, in between the, uh, the podcast, I'll also try to ask some of the personal tips that she uh, really uh, uh, focuses on, on how to be much more productive. She has a stellar profile of doing a lot of things, not just uh, research and computer science, which is one thing that uh, a lot of PhD students need to learn to be much more diverse and not just a geeky nerd. So definitely I'll, I'll try to poke more, on, uh, more, poke, more uh, poke her more on that. And towards the end of this podcast, I'll try to learn more about what she's working on. And I know she's working on a lot of um, interpretable, uh, interpretability and AI uh, models for medicine. So I'll try to learn more about her insights into these fields. So, uh, okay, uh, without, uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll start the podcast is to ask, can you tell us something about what you are currently working on? Uh, and what, what is your PhD thesis uh, right now focusing on? Yeah, so my PhD thesis is focused on evaluating generative models. So generative models, including GANs, uh, are basically models that are able to generate maybe fake images or something, um, uh, or model a distribution. Uh, and so unlike a classifier, which is a discriminative model, which is trying to differentiate maybe a cat from a dog, a generative model is trying to model like all cats or all dogs or all pizzas or even all animals like <laughs> or all human faces is a uh, common one which I can uh, show behind me here. So these are all fake faces. These are not real people behind me. Um, <laughs> but evaluating them is really difficult. So uh, my PhD thesis is focused on that. Uh, uh, however, given my knowledge of these models, I've also seen important applications uh, for social good, specifically in medicine, as well as in climate change. Um, and right now I have three core projects uh, in medicine, combining generative models with, uh, with the medical, uh, with various medical areas, specifically in medical imaging. Um, so in pathology and radiology, and we're collaborating. So I have a group of students who are amazing, about nine or 10, um, collaborating with, I think we have five or six Stanford professors uh, in, in the medical school wow. that we're working with. Yeah, and it's really fun. Um, and we are learning a ton, so leave it at that. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. And uh, uh, yeah, having, I guess, um, that brings me to a very nice question that was on the list is uh, when you're trying to collaborate with a lot of uh, professors who are not necessarily from computer science domain, they might be, I, I'm, I'm assuming they would be a radiologist and medical professionals. Uh, one thing I, I always uh, tend to ask uh, people who I invite is, what is the end goal of using AI, AI applications for medical purposes? Are we looking for potential medical discoveries or is it just a tool for automation? I mean, uh, what, is the, what is the end goal as a researcher, as a student for developing these deep learning models? that you think? Yeah, so when we, I think it depends on the nature of the collaboration. So I think uh, many collaborations start off with, well, what is the medical problem? How can we improve it? Are there ways to improve patient outcomes? Are there ways to actually, you know, 
improve the way we treat people or diagnose people or even think about healthcare as an industry, um, like the operational side perhaps. Um, and then beyond that, like, can we help with the science and discovery? That is another, I think, question. Uh, and I think on the flip side that people don't think about is with this collaboration, you also get to see problems uh, emerge on the technical side too, where you otherwise wouldn't see uh, by just working on, let's say an image net data set. Um, so when you work with, let's say medical images, you're like, oh shoot, uh, I didn't realize that the ground truth gold standard could be so contended. Like the, it's not just inter-rater reliability is kind of off because it's not just looking at cats and dogs, which are obvious to us. It's, I'm not sure if there's cancer in this, in this, um, in this person's intestine, you know, and two pathologists might not agree. And actually the same pathologist might not agree if his boss is in the room or she might not agree with herself if she is, like is segmenting these bacteria later on down the line after she's used to using your segmentation tool. So there's a lot of these things that pop up that are new problems that then uh, bring on kind of new questions on the technical side too that I find really interesting. Yeah, I guess the common phrase that goes um... Uh, modern problems requires mo modern solution really helps over here i guess um, yeah. i guess that might that might be the role for uh, using machine learning on these things but um, yeah interesting that thing that you mentioned is uh, uh, i guess the role of gans like that is one of the uh, beautiful things that you have on your profile is you have a really great expertise in GANs and GANs really go well for medical applications because even now that I feel, I mean, I, I used to hear this a lot that GANs are really useful for medical applications and blah, blah. But now that I'm collaborating with a lot of projects on Mayo Clinic and DODs, I, when I actually get the data sets, uh, they are like a sample size of maybe 15 patients and they are trying to expect uh, um, to develop a machine learning model. And that is, that is the actual time that I realized, okay, this is not going to work. Like 15 samples is like nuts for machine learning. It's, it's not going to give you any, anything really insightful that a human cannot. So uh, while even then uh, we do try, we, we do explore the uh, application of machine learning, but what is the time like have, how do you how do you explore the differences between trying out new model architectures like transfer learning or any other other mo models that can be really useful for uh, small data sets versus trying to augment the data now that we know that we have a small size how do you make that decision that should I, should you develop a better architecture or tr try to develop a model that can that can be really well uh, trained on smaller data sets versus I should be focusing more on creating artificial data sets. How do you, how do you make that decision? Right. Great question. I think it always makes sense to start off by training some kind of classifier on your data, of course, splitting it correctly. So making sure that your evaluation protocol is um, sound and in place. Uh, and then taking it from there, seeing how much first ablating real data is useful. Uh, so then you get a sense of the curve of adding data seems to be, you know, it seems to be increasing not only monotonically, but like without diminishing returns. And so then you think, oh, maybe adding more data will be useful in some way too. And then you go on to build your generative model for data augmentation, or even use some simple data augmentation techniques um, to demonstrate that. Hmm. That makes sense. And um, uh, what would you say would be one of the potential concerns that a person or a researcher should know while using GANs on sensitive data sites like uh, medical imaging? And as you mentioned, like you might not know that this person, like this particular data has the person being infected or not. Like for example, the cancer thing, like if I give you an image, there might, you, you might not know that there are things to be expected and not to be expected for a person to classify as um, diseased versus like healthy uh how how like how, okay let me phrase this question the other way like <laughs> how would you how would you say uh like what would be the way to make sure like is it just like human observation that is at the bottleneck for evaluating these data sets or like how do i make sure that if i used gans on neuroimaging data the data generated is not something um wrong medically wrong i would say Right, I think it's important, like one really important caveat when using GANs or any generative model is typically to think about, you know, these models are trying to optimize often for, for in the case of GANs, realism. 
and what does realism really mean there? Um, and it's defined kind of by this discriminator, this other model that's trying to um, uh, model the reward function for realism. And so realism could mean, hey, this looks like really realistic cancer, but this person doesn't actually have cancer. And so that would be really problematic. So just knowing that these models are often hallucinating things or hallucinating away things is really important when you're uh, using them. So you shouldn't say, oh, I, I can suddenly generate all this really important data, or I can I suddenly know what condition you have, um, but you might be hallucinating something. So I think to be very cautious of that is really important. All right. So would that would that mean that okay, if I if I wanted to augment a particular data set, let's say the fifty data samples that I was talking about, mm -hmm. would you say I should I should particularly use GANs to generate artificial Im images, and then maybe at least for let's say next fifty images, I should allow a doctor to maybe monitor or maybe at least inspect that particular data set, and if the hallucination is a a big factor, maybe GANs are not particularly useful for that use case scenario. Would you would you say along along those lines? I think if the data you're generating is the end state, like the end thing you're going to be handing off and say like um, you're doing super resolution for, for some kind of image, right? So you don't have to give as much radiation to the patient. Then I would worry a bit and think about how can you embed physics? How can you think about all those kind of things that are going into um, the image already uh, for an MRI, for example. But then I think if you're doing just data augmentation and you have, let's say, some kind of discriminative model like a classifier at the other end doing, you know, classifying um, things into cancerous, not cancerous, then I think you're a little bit safer because your GAN is just trying to generate images that look um, like one or the other and to help your classifier find that line that delineates cancerous or non cancerous. I think it's always very helpful during debugging to have not only a healthcare professional who's working with you and can diagnose those images for you, but also for yourself to learn some of those things. So never be scared of doing kind of what feels like grunt work of labeling. I've labeled thousands and thousands of like little and segmented little bacteria. And now, and I've even reviewed Anki cards to study them myself. So I know what they look like. That way I know, you know, what kind of model might work on this. Um, and I think that's really useful uh, and really important to, to the work. And it's not like necessarily grunt and whatever work um, and not necessarily something you would want to outsource. It might be something you want to do as an ML engineer or ML researcher to just understand the problem very deeply um, yourself, so. Right, and this brings me like this brings me to another question that I wanted to save it for later on. But yeah. I guess this is the right time to ask. Is um, I know I knew you had a you you have a background in a much more different domain, definitely uh, not computer science and definitely not medical professionalism. So I, guess, um, <laughs> sure. uh, I, I I want to learn more from you. Like, what was your background, and how did you how did you uh, end up? learning these things very efficiently like first of all machine learning that is on the forefront because you are trying to do something really innovative that takes a lot of uh, skills in uh, implementing these things and definitely researching and secondly dealing with medical data because one thing that i personally have realized like it's it's a whole different like i i, I guess i almost took this particular fall 2020 semester just to understand the data that i'm dealing with what is the expectations and what does it really mean to classify a person as a disease or not so how did, can you talk more about your transition from your previous majors to what you're working right now? Like what was your, what was the transition like and how did you manage that? Yes, absolutely. So if you rewind enough in my life, I was obsessed with languages, foreign languages. I still am, I still love them. Um, specifically, uh, I got really deep into Latin, uh, the classics and loved reading poetry. Um, so that's what I did. Um, at Harvard, which was my undergrad. And I think if you kind of track my academic career, it looks like, you know, uh, look at this good, like valedictorian student, graduated summa from Harvard, you know, seems to have gone to class, you know, PhD at Stanford. Um, I don't go to class, like that's my trick, I think. So I, I, I don't think that's where I learn best. I think some people certainly learn best that way but I don't learn best that way. And if that speaks to you, that's great. <laughs> I am very grateful for Google search <laughs> because that's where I find a lot of resources. Um, 
something that I also love doing is I love cold calling people. So, uh, and Jay seems to also love cold calling people. So I love that. And it, <laughs> I love that. I love that so much because you, I mean, you're going to have a huge rejection rate. That's fine. Um, or maybe you won't. I have had a huge rejection rate, but the few people who do respond, um, I don't know, end up changing kind of the course of where you might go and the various things that you're willing to experiment with um, also change that. Um, so uh, Andrew was very much, my advisor is very much a, a cold call away and um, previous advisors have also been a cold call away. And I found computer science as just a whim um, in college. I took the intro course uh, mainly because I was just really bad at technology and I didn't think I had anything to lose actually. So I thought I could just help myself a little bit after breaking like five phones in a row. So. I took it and I was like, oh, this is actually quite mathy. I really, I like math. Um, and I see it as just another language. So C and Python, they're all just C++, they're all just new languages, just like Latin and Greek and <laughs> French and Mandarin and everything. And so um, they are all just new languages to me. And so to me, they were very similar in some ways since they have syntax. Uh, and um, so I just, I, I fell in love with it mainly because uh, one of the professors in one of my classes, the first day he said, it's never the user's fault. And I just thought it's never been my fault. And then I realized I can design systems that don't make people feel stupid. Um, and then that very much has carried on with my career. And so building the GANS course on Coursera is also, I can build a course that doesn't make people feel stupid and actually be engaging and make people have fun and feel like they can learn this and feel like they can have, they have the confidence inside of them to go do it. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's been kind of the theme that's driven me very much into this area. Wow, well, that's that's pretty interesting to know. I I I I, I definitely research a lot about you, but this was one for one of the facts that I didn't know. But that's really interesting. And uh, talking more about like trying other things around. I I know you you have a, a lot of experience with uh, product management. That is something highly unlikely. Definitely at this age uh, and doing a PhD per, uh, PhD uh, in in parallel to that and to to me my understanding was definitely academic research is definitely not intersection with the product management to <laughs> me it was more like only if you only if you transition to a senior position where you know the company around you know all the technologies you are using and then then only uh, you can really uh, be sufficient enough to be a product management so i want to learn more about what is product management according to you in a much more student friendly manner like mm -hmm. what what does it really entail what, what does product management really entail and how did you build up your skills or expertise for uh, getting at least showcasing your skills that hey i'm i'm good enough person for product management i'm, I'm technically sound but i can also contribute to the design of a product can you talk more about that absolutely so i actually fell into product management before even thinking about research and um uh, machine learning actually even. So, uh, I, uh, so Latin actually is kind of a constraint satisfaction problem. It's a very logical language. It's like a puzzle. Um, and what else is a constraint satisfaction problem is time management and kind of breaking things up into different components and figuring out, um, different, how different people operate and what they, uh, are motivated by and also what kind of tasks they like to work on. And so product management is lar a large part is um, figuring out, you know, what type of work needs to be done and how to break that up and how to allocate that and who to allocate that to. And I just like love that almost bipartite graph matching problem. It's just so fun with, and with humans and you get to interact with all sorts of different types of people, which I love. Um, I think the other side of it is understanding the user, um, which I, I think I mentioned a little bit before about not making anyone feel stupid. So that that requires understanding the person who's going to be using your technology and um, uh, which at a, uh, at a company is often your customer, your user. Um, and I love thinking about that too, because I want to think about, you know, how would this person engage with this? Maybe not an expert, maybe, maybe someone who's thinking about X, Y, Z, or who wants to get ABC done. And so um, that's also a part of the product management 
role. And I would say the last part that I think about with the product management role is it depends on the company you're at, but it also sometimes entails kind of protecting your team and creating that kind of team um, a bonding experience. And so I, I really like that aspect as well um, and bringing people together, getting them motivated to do stuff, doing something fun, engaging and rewarding um, are all components of it. And so I fell into product management first out of college since it was my favorite job uh, that I, in, I did an internship at. I did, I did software engineering. I did like finance consulting stuff. I didn't really actually enjoy them as much, but I love product management. I thought it was exactly how my head already worked. Um, so I fell into that, but then I felt like I wanted to get a little bit more technical. And I think that's what brought me into the PhD program. I also really want to start my own company at some point. And I realized there were some really smart people there in the program and I wanted to get to know them <laughs> um, for potentially, you know, something I heard Google came out of Stanford PhD. So why not give that a go? Um, and I learned about machine learning there. I actually have never taken a machine learning course, <laughs> official course. Um, <laughs> so don't feel like okay. you have to, but I've, I, I have listen to some of Andrew's um, lectures. Uh, so yeah, there's just everything I've, most everything I've learned has either been completely publicly available online or from talking or from being very fortunate to be surrounded by cool people and jam with them on different topics and learn from them. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I don't know how I can uh, express this, but I relate to you on a much more like many levels that you just said over there, many of the things that you just okay. mentioned. And I guess you are the only person who would actually be a testament that, okay, this is really possible because for me, yes, I still do. I, I before this, at least checking out your profile, I still thought that product management was something really like you can either start from a very small company who, who desperately needs a person who can understand these things around. But I guess you working at Google and other companies, I haven't seen that they are like pro ML companies. So they are definitely uh, digging your profile. They, they are liking what, whatever you did. So, and of course, starting like working at a startup and um, at least thinking about uh, starting your own idea is definitely one thing I'm, even I'm looking uh, forward to. So definitely thanks a lot for at least uh, being a player in that. But um, talking a, a, a bit more detail, I, I swear I won't uh, dig you more deep on that is, but how would you, how would you say one can really build up a profile regardless of a PhD student or a software development engineer, how can one really build a profile for product management? Like, I mean, what is the ideal expectation? And like, I don't know. I, I don't want to talk along the lines like, like how to crack those interviews, but can you talk more about like, what do they really want to see in you? Like what are the, what are the ABCs of a product management role? Yeah. So, um, I think the best way to get exposure, I think the first, first thing is like figure out if this is something you want to do. Um, and the way to kind of figure that out, I think the easiest two ways are one is get some kind of internship in product management at a bigger company. It's gonna have a different flavor of product management than a small company, but it'll give you a sense of the some day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and if you like that, continue on doing that at that company or it'll be much easier to move after you have one of those. Um, and don't always, you don't always have to do it at Google. Like you could, you could go somewhere like quote unquote lower tier, whatever, it doesn't matter. Like the point is to get you to figure out if this is a good fit for you, if you like it. If you like it, you can always um, advance. And then I think the second thing that you could do um, pretty easily uh, is to either start a company or join a small company and become that product person. And so there are materials out there to read up on what a product person should do, but really it is about thinking about your user and designing and figuring out what you need to build for that product and easily allocating those jobs to um, the engineering team, for example, or interfacing with marketing and all this other stuff. And just being able and willing to wear a lot of hats at that company and be very helpful. Um, I think of product management as, I think someone said this once, like as oiling the wheels of a car. So you're not actually, you shouldn't think of yourself as essential because the rest of the team is essential. They're doing like work, they're writing code, they're committing it, yeah. it's pushed, <laughs> it goes into production. You, what are you doing? You're just oiling 
uh, those wheels, but just like, you gotta be really good at oiling those wheels to stay. Otherwise you will probably be the first person to be cut. So it's kind of like doing the things in the cracks and being willing to do um, things that might not be super glamorous. Yeah. Hmm, that's that's really interesting. And would you, would you happen to have any insights of the key differences between these roles? Like I know you are, you have juggled a lot bit around what software development can really provide. I mean, you are right now an academic researcher at a very, uh, very elite year university and working on some very nice problems. On the other hand, you have also tried your hands on teaching definitely Coursera. Like I'm, I'm sure like definitely a teaching assistant and something would have also been there along the lines, but uh, you have also tried software engineering as an intern at some places, product management. What were the, like, if you, if you could summarize few lines, like what, what are the things that you might have learned along those lines? How, how does the, uh, applications differ? How, how the technical role, how, how the technicality in these roles differ? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think of software engineering as, um, kind of really interesting puzzles that you're solving all the time. Um, and so you're given, you know, maybe potential input and output, but you have to figure out the most efficient way, given your knowledge of, uh, it could be, you know, in machine learning, or it could be even broader systems level things. And that, that can get really interesting. You're like, oh, I understand the cash works this way, blah, blah, blah. And so um, I think like it's, on, it's solving those problems um, that you find really interesting and that should gravitate you towards the that, that area, like architecting those kind of things. Um, I think software engineering, of course, uh, has not only that role there, but also you could become, you know, an engineering manager. People often like to think about engineering problems, but uh, also want to be able to manage people. And that is a very open opportunity. In fact, I think there aren't enough of those people who are good at both. And then um, product management, I would say, is you're a little bit more divorced from the um, coding aspect of things. And it's less about that type of problem solving um, kind of with a computer, it's more with humans, with other human beings and a little bit of more negotiation there. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of that. And um, you're, the way you test things is a little bit different. You're testing with users as opposed to, you know, running internal tests to see uh, what like profiling your code, like figuring out if it passed all these unit tests and it's a little bit different there. And then I think research, um, you are, not thinking as much about unit tests, I think, <laughs> or reliability. You are just going as fast as you can in one direction. Um, and uh, hopefully writing kind of clean code around along the way, but definitely towards a deadline. I can't guarantee anything. Um, uh, but uh, a second on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think with research, it's thinking about kind of, oh, given the state of the world right now of where, of our knowledge, what is um, that plus one step, but also what is that like 10 X step and where, like, where do we, like, where can we uh, push this frontier? And so you're always thinking about what that frontier is and where do you push on it in all different types of ways. And I think that is different from kind of a startup co-founder because a startup co-founder is pushing in exactly one direction almost all the time and very focused. And I think with research, it almost is useful to be a little more scattered because um, that way you're you're tying in this and this, this and that, and then that and this and all over the place. And you can eventually form a cohesive thing, but you are thinking a little bit more, um, thinking a little bit more broadly. Um, so I, yeah, that would be my takes on those, those roles. Yeah, definitely. I heard I heard this in talk somewhere. I am not able to cite to where exactly I thought, but I guess a, the person said that um, research is much more open-ended because we don't know what we are researching about. It's much more about uh, discovering something along the lines that you have expertise or at least build an expertise. But I guess for the industrial perspective, the goal is much more focused. Like you said, it's along one line that is like trying to at least build a product that can serve and at least scale to maximum number of users. So yeah, definitely that uh, really makes sense. And um, before I jump to a much more nerdy and geeky question along your research expertise, I wanted to know, like I am trying out these new things about at least like people would know your ac academic accomplishments using your uh, CV resume or your website and of course Twitter and all those things but I wanted to ask a few questions that might not be that might be on a different tangent to hold your research profile right. and um, uh, your uh, productivity skills is 
uh, how do you manage your time i mean and you might be the best person to ask this question is you are not uh, you are not linear like you have you have at least tried a lot of things i was reading one of your art- art- articles on linkedin that you uh, openly mentioned that you don't like to focus your efforts on one topic for a very long amount of time and hence you try to diversify your uh, efforts that you give to but along those lines most of the people face problems is managing those times i mean doing a phd at stanford it's definitely not a joke it's it has its own um, deliverables how do you manage those times and what are the things that you do to at least um, make you feel good like i i know you just mentioned you have been to miami just a few days back so that that is one thing i guess uh, refreshes you but what are the other things in a day to day life that you do to manage your skills and manage your mood i guess if if that's the word. Yeah, so uh all thanks to Google Calendar, my life is uh <laughs> I think Google Calendar um or just calendar in general uh, helps me a lot or I use it to help me a lot because I set a lot of uh reminders, but not just reminders, but like evaluation milestones and goals. And so I'm okay with being let's say heads down for x amount of time and then I have a date that I put into my calendar that says you need to rethink what you're doing now or like oftentimes i like to structure things as exploration and then exploitation like a multi-arm bandit and so i uh will give myself time to explore and it can be very frustrating i think sometimes because it's like i'm juggling too many different things this is maybe not worth like i'm not sure which one's worth my time maybe i should just only focus on one thing at a time but then having that date to say explore until then maybe it's 2 weeks maybe it's 2 months maybe it's 2 years and i think i've done all those horizons um <laughs> explore for that long and then decide on one thing delete everything else go like find something you like and i think um generally being open to new things is is good but i think also making sure that you have you're not juggling too much is is also really important so different things i've done to kind of manage that our notion uh is a software i use a lot um where i get to write out you know what are the key projects that i'm focused on right now and what are like the key deliverables i want on them um both short term and long term and then uh another thing i also use are physical like notebooks and sticky notes and i would actually kind of write on a sticky note in different color on different color sticky notes you know these are my high priority things these are my low priority things or like sometimes i also uh have those uh calendar events to assess you know where am i at with all my projects how do i actually feel about these projects you know i've been trying to heads down i don't want to put any judgment to them as much as i start off on them cuz you never know where it goes but then now that i've put a few months into them or or a few weeks into them where where is my head at and where is my heart at with these projects um if i don't feel like this is something for me then i should abandon it in some way but i should also figure out why i don't like it and is it is it the people is it the type of project i certainly thought i would be interested when i went in right so why did that not pan out the way it did and then and then crafting the next thing to be something that you like and then iterating of course it's never going to be perfect but continuing to iterate i think is is important there hmm, that's that's quite interesting i can i can actually take few of the tips over there definitely because i see myself struggling along those lines so yeah i'll i'll borrow some of those things and um what would be one thing that you are you are or you have tried recently that not re- you are not really proud of telling out but one thing that really you do when you close your laptop or your books or your uh, academic hat uh, what is one thing that uh, you are you are still struggling at but you want to do that because you really like doing that any kind oh, of hobby super, i think oftentimes it's learning about an area i don't know anything about um and so medicine was definitely that at some point um learning about climate climate change and climate science in general that was a huge undertaking as well because i i really knew next to nothing same with medicine i really knew next to nothing um i i thought i was just a complete foreigner and wasn't sure if anyone would be willing to talk to me and then now i feel comfortable with it and i can't believe i've gotten there and each time that happens um i i think it's a feeling of peter teal puts it as like 0 to 1 like 0 to 1 like oh my gosh i got to 1 it's not like i'm at 100 or like 
a billion, which is where the experts are, but I'm at one. And that feels really cool because I can maybe um, understand some of the things. Maybe I can start to even read papers in this area. Um, so, so yeah, but something uh, completely aside from research, um, I am, <laughs> I don't know if this is even related, but I was in Hawaii recently and uh, I'm learning to surf. <laughs> I'm not super good at it. <laughs> um, wow. um, well, I am good at it if you give me a little push from behind. Uh, but yeah, my I, <laughs> I believe my arm muscles are a bit lacking for the the surf <laughs> for surfing. But it's really fun to stand up. So I think uh, that's awesome. And I, I'm very new to it. I'm yeah. But I I think it is objectively the coolest sport. I think we have to say that it is very cool. Yeah. I don't think I look cool doing it, but it's cool. So, yeah. <laughs> at least, yeah, I mean, at least if, if that really interests you, uh, it doesn't matter if you are an expert, but at least if doing that, uh, you really feel enjoyed, then yeah, that's the end thing that matters. But uh, yeah, just one last question before I jump to the uh, one uh, other topic of your research is, what is one philosophical question that you tend to ask yourself a lot and uh, you you try to find your answers but you know you cannot find your answer any kind of uh, philosophical dilemma that you have you you want an answer but you feel struggle while trying to find an answer or is mm -hmm. that like I'm, I'm i'm sure if uh, i can ask like oh, if there is any i'm i'm, I'm not <laughs> sure if everybody has one <laughs> well there's definitely um kind of the question of uh for myself, like what is my, or what is, what do I want or what should be my utility function for like my, my own life. Um, and I've often distilled it to, I want my life to be as memorable as possible. And that means, um, and maybe that's why I do so many different things and so that it can build as many memories as possible. Um, but thinking about that, you know, how would you optimize for memorability or memorable experiences? Um, it's making sure that you're always on, always a little uncomfortable with the novelty of what you're working with. Um, and something I do have or had as a calendar, but I don't think I have it as anymore, but like I did have a, have a calendar reminder for myself every day and it was just one fearless thing. So I have to just do one fearless thing each day and it could be super small or super big once it was literally buy a plane ticket to London the next day. And uh, another time it was, um, it, it was just a cold call email, you know? So uh, I think that has really helped me get out of my own comfort zone. I actually, I, I think Everyone I've met since college has been like, you're a huge extrovert, but I was actually a huge introvert before and felt very uncomfortable even getting on the phone. Like that was just so much for me, but i um, trying to break out of that shell more and more. And now it's like, oh, it's different. I guess it's just completely different now. <laughs> um, so uh, I kind of live by that principle, but also I do question, you know, what is memorable? Um, what makes something memorable? Because sometimes it is uh, if you've watched Up, the Disney Pixar movie, um, it is like the mundane things are memorable or most meaningful, you know? So like at the end of the whole story, they're just watching cars drive by and that's just memorable because it's something mundane that you've done before. And yeah, it represents home. Yeah, definitely. I guess, uh, yeah, I, I, I recall that particular movie and I guess the perspective really matters a lot. Uh, how we look at things is if you if you look at few things as mundane, definitely it doesn't give you the same joy versus if you if you look at it in a different perspective. So yeah, definitely. That's that's really interesting. And uh, yeah, trying to jump back to the original line, I, I if, if time permits, we'll talk more about your uh, personal questions. Uh, jumping back to the original line is uh, one of the few, I, I want to poke you more around, around the line of uh, interpretability in machine learning is we know like a classic problem with machine learning models is we know it, it really, it, it can perform really well uh, based on the data set that it receives. And we st it's, it's still an open research problem to understand how the model will behave in case of novel data. We are like, there, there are still a lot of uh, pay, uh, research papers that I still uh, see coming up that cannot justify if the model can really perform in case of a different type of data set that it, it gets showed to. So how do you, uh, uh, and feel free to uh, take any instance if you have any, 
uh, to talk more about how do you make sure that this particular model will not behave or will behave uh, notoriously in case of new data? Are there any ways to make sure uh, that the model might not uh, behave notoriously for new data? And if there are any, how which methods have you found out to be the best? Yeah, so the area of um, robustness is both really important and I find really interesting, um, both from a, uh, I guess, on the research frontier, the worst case scenario, which is those adversarial examples, and also from, um, and also from the practical perspective of, you know, what are the most common perturbations, corruptions that we do see and expect, and can we mitigate our models from even from even those? Uh, so I think, I think that's that's even like one big step that we need to make sure our models are able to handle uh, even the common corruptions and perturbations that will occur in images um, or videos or, or data more broadly. Um, and I think um, to mitigate against a lot of this is uh, an understanding of what those perturbations and corruptions could be, but also kind of building into the model an idea of, I don't know, of giving the model the ability to say, I don't know. Um, and that could be through uncertainty. So outputting some type of uncertainty with its predictions um, and learning that uncertainty, uh, both aleatoric and epistemic uh, during the training process. Or it could also, I mean, it could also mean for um, giving explainable predictions in some way to be much more useful. And I, I typically think of that as, that is also just making it useful for the downstream uh, user of this model, which there often will be. Um, and if it's a doctor, then it's even more important. Um, and I don't think, I think that's a very unsolved problem in terms of what the optimal types of interfaces we should be giving to doctors. I think there was recently a Kai paper on this from Google um, on um, kind of interpretable interfaces for doctors, but. Um, I haven't seen that much that I've been super, I would say super impressed with or made me feel like, wow, we are at like the peak of this, this field. So I think it's still moving, trending upwards and still kind of a very, um, very great area to get into if it's, if it's interesting to, to folks. Hmm. Interesting. And talking more about like um, you mentioned, uh, it is still an unsolved problem is one of the other things that I because I'm, I'm trying to focus my research work more on building interpretable mod AI models for uh, neuroimaging data. And there is a lot of other like textual data that also we are trying to receive. When, when I'm trying to actually address this problem, I feel a lot of questions is to understand what exactly do I mean by making an AI model interpretable? Like what would be an end goal? Like what do I see my deep learning model to be behaving like? When can I say uh, it is interpretable? So if, if you can, uh, I know this is a very subjective question even in research and I guess it would depend on your perspective is how do you envision interpretability when we are dealing with let's say neuroimaging data which is like a very rich content uh, information data but how do i how do i if if i have a deep learning model um, behaving well on neuroimaging data and if somebody asks me make this particular model interpretable what do you what do you really see as an endpoint over there and the next question or a follow-up would be in case of multimodal data because i guess most of the uh, organizations are not trying to switch to multimodal data how do you envision interpretability in this case? And I'm, I'm trying to uh, ask you more questions like, how do you see, like right now we see there are a few metrics that can say that, okay, it is trying to do better than uh, the other models. How do you see that particular uh, milestone of interpretability in these two scenarios? Right, so um, maybe a quick uh, definition of interpretability and versus explainability, how I see it, I'm sure, I think, I think the definitions are a little bit um, contended, but um, for the sake of establishing a, a definition so I make sense, I think of interpretability as um, understanding what the model is thinking and like how the model came to a certain conclusion. And explainability, which is very closely coupled to this, is understanding, um, being able to have predictions that are coming out of the model that are easy to explain um, and understand uh, to, to a person. And for interpretability, I would love, I would love, love, love to see um, 
AI models be able to, in the medical field especially, to be as interpretable as um, another human doctor in the room. So let's say a doctor is interacting with this AI, let's call it an AI doctor. It's able to have a conversation with this doctor to come to a conclusion. Because realistically, a lot of these cases that we see for any many diagnoses often come down to putting a lot of different specialists or experts in a room and having them decide, oh, this person has blah cancer or this person has sepsis because it's a systemic body, like full body problem. Um, and I would love to see that be possible. Um, and with that obviously comes various caveats like, oh, the AI probably shouldn't lie. <laughs> and um, it's probably capable of some kind of dialogue. Like there's so much involved, like it, it's so huge and it might border on AGI, but it's like, it would be amazing to, to have that because then I think I'd be able to understand it more um, and see that, but maybe that is just anthropomorphizing it too much. And there is something even better that we could have that is not as human. That's not mimicking the human at least. Yeah. I haven't thought of that though. Since I'm, you're the one doing the PhD and so I will leave you to that, but that would be cool. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, because I guess the question, uh, yeah, it, it still boils down to the uh, same confusion is to understanding interpretability really varies from uh, application to application, data to data, and the people who are trying to interact with it. I guess the closest thing that I found as of now in terms of uh, literature is it really, like uh, I, I was reading a few of the papers where they say um, uh, having too much of information as an explanation is a curse to any of like, even if they are patients or even if they are doctors, you, it, it really, it, it really like not a lot of people support interpretively because they just don't want as long as the model serves good enough results in certain scenarios, then yes. So I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to maybe look if there is any formal pipeline that can say, okay, for making an interpretable model, uh, of course you can tune in these parameters and hence you will get an inter interpretable model. But yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe I guess it's, it's still an open research work uh, in computer science domain. But yeah, um, it's hard to ask uh, models to give only the pertinent information. You know, it's like typically we're like, oh, print out the loss, print out, print out that. Give us all this stuff that we've pre-specified, versus give us only the important information that we want from you when making this diagnosis. So like, only give me the uncertainty when it's relevant. Give only, you know, like because that's what humans do, and so it's not an overload of information. Basically, I'll put a TikTok video because that's how long a person can <laughs> can uh, maintain attention, like the attention span. So, <laughs> yeah, excellent. <excellent>. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's gonna go well. Like, don't take that literally, metaphorically, metaphorically. Yeah, yeah, it, it's funny. I didn't take that literally, so <laughs> I, I, did, I did take that literally. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe a fun thing if if I made claims for achieving interpretability and if I didn't <laughs> end up doing that, I can definitely cite this particular video of that. Hey, I I got this inspiration for this idea from Shad. No need to cite so, me. I can be a non. I can be a non. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. And yeah, this brings me to the last question in terms of uh, the geeky nerdy topics that we are covering is how do you how do you see the, f at least I, I won't term the say future, but at least near future of using AI for medicine, me medical applications is, uh, I, I know uh, you know about these uh, levels that we have with self-driving, we see a great amount of a very uh, exponential growth in how it has automated driving purposes. Do you see, or where do you see, right, the current state of use of AI for medical applications? Are we near, are we near to any kind of automation or is that the end goal? Like, do we do are we uh, do do people or radiologists or computer science researchers look at making things automated for medical purposes? Something like what Tesla is doing for driving. Uh, are we looking somewhere along those lines, or are we just going to stay much more uh, human in control scenarios with AI applications? Mm, yeah. So I think with cars, things are a lot less 
I would say, I think things are a lot more homogenous and less hybrid. Um, and uh, if like there's one self-driving car that's level five, we'll get everything to be level five. Like, I think we can get things to that level uh, and the in-between won't be as long, but I think with medicine, it will be, it will be a long in between of having things that are fully automated and things that are used for augmentation purposes, augmenting a human doctor, for example, or a technician, for example, it doesn't always have to be someone who has um, a decades of training. Uh, I, I, and I think the places where it'll be automated the most are areas where um, we might not get as much attention from doctors now due to either um, availability or just like funding is it's ridiculous how much funding uh, dictates a lot of this. Um, so like cancer will probably get like, you know, there are a lot of doctors in it, a lot of research, a lot of attention, but like very important diseases that are much rare, but also do are extremely fatal might benefit from AI uh, in some way because they don't get as much attention. Um, and so, and of course, under-resourced areas will also benefit. And that could mean um, areas in, uh, areas in India, China, in uh, Africa, but it could also mean um, just <laughs> not cities in the US. Um, it's like you can't get, um, you can't get, a, let's say a CTP scan um, in rural hospitals in the US. You have to go to a major city and you have to go during the day, like during operating hours, because it's expensive to have that technician. So given that, well, why not have something automated in the background? And we've seen with COVID that our systems can be overwhelmed. And given that we should have automation somewhere, even if it's in the background, what if after this, we have these background COVID, you know, um, uh, detectors that are just looking at every x-ray or every CT scan that comes in, just, just, just in case, like no, like maybe the radiologist isn't looking for that. Um, maybe the specialist, who's not a radiologist or the generalist, the um, your general physician is not looking for that. And yet they're able to, um, the model's able to see it in the background. And I think that can be anywhere. That can be any busy hospital in the city. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess, uh, I guess it still boils down, boils down to the same uh, conclusion that uh, in case of uh, decision-centric uh, applications, we still want the medical professionals to be in control, but AI is something they are using it as a tool and not as a replacement. So I guess that would be the ideal scenario. That would be a conclusion to whatever you said. Is that correct? Or is, did I did I understand it correctly? I think that's where, yes, yes, where there are lots of doctors, but where there aren't, I don't, um, if it's like if it's between everyone dying and AI saving a few lives, then I think we should go with AI saving a few lives, uh, for sure, right. <laughs> and automating Definitely. everything. Yeah. Right. And just one last question, because uh, the, again, this wasn't on the list, but uh, I you mentioned something about using AI for climate uh, climate change mm -hmm. and using it for combating climate change. I would say, so I don't have a lot of um, research done on, on my personal legend, like how how exactly we are using uh, machine learning for uh, combating climate change. But can you can, from, just from an application perspective? We don't have to be really technical, but how do you how how have you seen machine learning really uh, having a great prospect of combating climate change and w what what is your research focus or what are your projects that you are trying to focus on for doing that yeah so there are a bunch and a lot of them originate from uh, working with satellite imagery so if you're in computer vision there are lots of things you can detect and predict in satellite imagery for example deforestation or understanding even the placement of renewable energy or the placement and attribution, so you can blame where fossil fuels are coming from. Um, so you could do all of those things at the satellite imagery level, where it would just be really tedious to have humans look through billions of images, like billions, and everything is in billions there, so it's huge. Um, so the scale is suitable for, uh, I think, AI machine learning. Um, and then, of course, uh, not always just in images, you could also look at uh, tabular data or some kind of time series data as well. Uh, for example, for uh, predicting uh, solar PV outputs, so solar panels, how much um, are solar panels actually uh, 
how much energy are they actually able to get um, that renewable energy. Predicting that at a certain location is very hard. We don't understand how clouds work. Actually, the physics of it are very, very complex. Um, and we don't understand it completely like from a physics point of view. So um, being able to model some of those interactions is really useful. Uh, and in general, this area suffers from a lack of funding, I think, the climate change space. So I think any lift you can give uh, is can be very, very helpful. Uh, there. And I, I will say that area is more politically charged than healthcare, arguably. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's true, actually. I don't know. <laughs> Both are highly regulated, politically charged. And I would say healthcare is more businessy and um, climate is more, you know, government regulation y. Um, but of course, both are both. Uh, and um, yeah, there is a lot less money going into it. And so um, it's about very much just dedicating your time to seeing what some of the problems are, where the data is just really not clean and where you can help with um, cohesively putting together a nice data set or a repository or database of where we're, wind turbines are, for example, which is a project that we've, we've done. And on the GAN side, on generative model side, um, one project that I really love that I collaborated with uh, Joshua Bengio's lab, Amila, is um, we generated flood scenes of any Google Street View image. And that was to kind of make it possible so that anyone could viscerally feel the effects of climate change. So you could put it in your house yeah. and get flooded if we have a few degrees of warming. Yeah, it's because we've read like, you know, climate communications literature says uh, people need to see it to believe it, not just like graphs. You know, graphs are not gonna tell you, oh, look, like one or two degrees of warming, you're not gonna, you're not gonna change your lifestyle based on that, but an image might do it if it's close to home, uh, very literally close to home. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, I guess uh, that data set itself calls for making a movie, I guess, just to scare off people, I guess. <laughs> a new Google Earth of uh, Atlantis, basically. Google uh, Earth Atlantis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's that's really interesting. Few of the things I didn't knew um, that exist, and I, yeah, I guess now that you said like modeling these interactions of uh, nature elements is uh, definitely uh, really going to be tough, and adding in computer science is definitely uh, not something uh, easy. So yeah, I, I I didn't look at that that way. That's really interesting. And awesome. Uh, just one last question because I know you. I I have to ask this one. I I, I promise this is the last right. one. Is um, no worries. Uh, just. <laughs> Uh, just a question from a newbie in computer science, I would say, or because I can, I guess I can poke around on different topics is how can one really know what are his or her interests in, uh, as to understanding, is he really a person who enjoys, uh, system level jobs or software development or uh, product management research, or <laughs> I don't know if, if that computer science is not good for him or her, how, uh, how have you narrowed down your interest on what on uh, your understanding of how uh, how how much you are uh, how much or whether you like computer science applications or not because i guess i can ask you because you you started off your computer science at a much more mature level than uh, at least people who start off their undergrads uh, in computer science so how can one really know uh, is it really a brute force approach to know those things or uh, what what are the things that you did that helped you try to narrow down your interest yeah, so a lot of it comes down to experimentation um, and also being willing to explore a lot. And I mean, just, you know, I, I actually, no one pushed me into working on GANs. Uh, I had no idea I liked it. None of my advisors at the time were working on it. Andrew's not working on it. I'm actually like his expert, apparently, according to him, on GANs and, and generative models. And so that's been kind of cool. But, uh, I found it on my own from seeing a few papers float by, you know, on archive, reading them, and then becoming really fascinated, and then just continuing to read them. But initially, I didn't, my research was not in that area uh, at all. And so I was just pushing along, you know, I knew I wasn't completely happy, like I knew I would, I didn't find something I super loved. I just, I just kept getting distracted by GANs and generative models. Like I would spend my weekends reading up about it. I would do secret projects on it. Okay. Like that's, <laughs> that's the only, I would do like secret projects. And then I would suddenly be like really excited wow. about something and then look 
tell Andrew about it. He's like, I think you really like these models. <laughs> like, yeah, I think you're right. And um, just deciding to push for it. Um, you don't always get support to push on something that you love and uh, that's okay. You can still push for it and find people who support you. And I think that's really important. And then finding other people who are also interested in it uh, over time uh, as, as you do that. So I, I think it's totally okay to not know what you like. Um, according to my mom, she said she still doesn't know. <laughs> so I don't know. This, I don't know how long this exploration goes. I'm glad I found something this early <laughs> relative to her. Um, but uh, uh, I, I mean, I've, I, it's okay to also love many things um, and to love things to varying degrees. Uh, but it definitely feels good to uh, converge on something uh, after exploring for a long time. But being willing to explore and try really weird different things is is the way to go. I've done some very weird different things. Um, and some of them, I'm like, I never want to do that again. And other things, I'm like, this is going to be part of my repertoire in some way. So. Hmm, that's that's really interesting. At least uh, I I feel a bit good about my uh, projects right now at my PhD. I guess you give me hope that okay, it's it's not just okay. I, I wouldn't be saying anything much, but uh, I I really feel good that I'm not really lost uh, uh, along my projects. So yeah, definitely. If uh, you if you and Andrew uh, definitely uh, felt that, so I guess it's normal for a PhD student to. Uh, feel lost and pursue his or her interest and then I guess uh, advisor can take it to the next level of understanding what is the uh, future of these particular technologies so yeah that's that's really interesting that's really interesting but um, yeah that's that's all I had I guess these were the questions that I planned to ask um, some of the questions were jumbled because we I tried to mix it up with some of the uh, answers you gave so it, it, it was really nice. I personally enjoyed a lot. Uh, I guess a uh, few things that I learned was um, many of these things that uh, you mentioned and what are your future goals really resonate with me. So I guess I'll be following you much more um, closely because uh, a lot of things really match. And it was, I, I guess you had fun too. Uh, it was really nice talking to you and share, having learned more about your insights. So yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. This was fun. <laughs> awesome.